in a market, there are only so many searches per month. So you can get to the point if you're just focused just on one market where you kind of max out a market. Mic check. I'm good. Mic check. Mic check. You can read about success all day long, but if you don't put in the work, the mindset, execution, and the hustle behind your vision, it just remains a dream. When everything goes wrong, you have to take all the responsibility. We uncover what high level entrepreneurs, business owners do to rise up from hustling daily. So do what you feel passionate about, take chances. The world becomes your library to help you to become better at your craft. Join me as I share with you actionable tips to help you grow your business, learn skills, and help you level up in your self-development journey. Your number one spot for business and personal growth is the Online Hustlers Podcast with your host, Esteban Andrade. Every day I'm hustling. What's going on, everyone? We have here another episode of the Online Hustlers Podcast. And in this episode, we're going to be covering everything REI, marketing, and conversion. And we have a very special and exciting guest here that uh, really have done a quite quite a shift in the few in the last in the last year actually in the real estate investing and wholesaling world. And let me explain to you, uh, Robert, who owns Investor Lift, actually have really dove into he really dove into a problem that a lot of people, all of you have. A lot of you uh, probably haven't started this business, about to start, or maybe are just starting out and have realized that this position, moving the properties and actually finding a buyers is one of the most important things in this process. Of course, you got to acquire properties. You got to be able to find the, the leads and uh, find those off-market deals. But moving those properties is what makes the money, all right? Because if you don't have a buyer, then you don't. You don't make money. You don't make the sign and fee. So Robert here has actually drilled down this problem and actually has created a system and technology for this. And we're going to actually dive into this, how you can actually take your wholesaling business, doesn't matter where you are right now, and take it to other levels by just fixing this position. So right here, I have Robert. I'm so excited. So, hey, man, I'm so excited to have you here. Thanks for having me on, brother. Let's actually show and, and, and actually showcase uh, who are you and what kind of impact or things you have done. Because a lot of people here might not know exactly what, uh, what you have done for, for us, uh, for wholesalers, for real estate investors, and for my members too. Uh, but some people, they do. So I want to make sure that you here come in here and, and just tell us exactly what are the things that you've been working in a few months and a few years and exactly where you are right now with that? Yeah, good question. So thanks for the great intro, by the way. You make me sound sound a lot better than I actually really am. But uh, uh, super pumped to be on here and hopefully drop some bombs, drop some uh, new game changing things that we've been working on and give you guys all some insights on how you can take your game to the next level of cuts. Um, what Esteban said is 100% right. Like you can do all the work on marketing, have the best PPC, the best Facebook, be crushing it, bringing in all these leads, have the best salespeople in the world, just locking down those contracts. But at the end of the game, unless you can sell that deal, unless you nail down Dispo, you don't get paid. All that work you did, all that money you spent is completely wasted. So that's really been the problem space um, that I've been working on. Uh, for the past few years and why I went and started uh, Investor Lift. Um, going back a little bit, like, so I started off, um, I remember when I was growing up, my friend's dad had like a Ferrari and a Lambo and like Rolex watch. And like when Nissan GTR came out, like the new one, he was like the first one in Canada to have it. And I'm like, man, I want to have Ferraris and Lambos when I grow up. I'm like, what do you do? He's like, I'm an investment banker. I'm like, how do we become an investment banker? He's like, go study finance and economics at a really good university and go work on Wall Street. I'm like, okay, where should I go to school? He's like, Harvard would be the best option. Okay. So that's literally what I worked on for like the first few years of my life. It's like, I want to become an investment banker. So I got out for Ferrari and I did my undergrad at Harvard, is directed in finance and economics. And I remember um, like right before graduation, I'm sitting in my dorm and I'm thinking like, man, I really don't like finance. 
<laughs> I'm graduating in like two weeks. <laughs> but I got to give you something. Not everyone actually gets to go to Harvard. Not everyone actually gets to graduate and do well and or even just sustain, you know, just get get to that university. Yeah. So probably some people, that. though, it's not worth the student debt uh, in most cases, unless you want to be a doctor or something. Just learn how to sell. I, I would have been much better off if I just learned how to sell because most of the stuff I learned in school, um, I never really apply that much. Uh, pretty much, I'm just kind of like self-taught afterwards. Um, but it was a fun party for four years. <laughs> Expensive one, but fun. <laughs> but I, I remember thinking about like finance. And if you if you guys follow stocks, like I'm sure probably people watching this invest, you know, on like Robinhood or buy and sell some crypto and things like that. Um, you, if you've done any of that, you know about like the buy sell spread. Well, back in the day, the buy sell spread used to be in the dollars. Right. But as the financial markets became more disrupted with uh, data and technology, it's gone down to like the like thousands of a penny. Like those markets became really, really efficient. So I'm like, why would I go start off my career in an industry that has already been disrupted by data and technology? It's every, people already did it in the 1990s and the 2000s. Like the average wealth manager out there, an algorithm can do their job a lot better. They won't tell yeah. you that, but that's the truth. So that was option number one. Or option number two, I was thinking a better long-term strategy would be to go get into an industry that hasn't been disrupted by data and technology yet. And I was looking at real estate, and this was back in uh, 2015. It's before Open Door, before all of that, for all the eye buyers. I'm like, man, real estate is just so behind the wave with technology and data. So archaic how they're doing everything. Well, let me go learn how to do that. Okay. So, of course, my like, Everyone's like freaking out, like Robert, like, turn down all your like good finance jobs to go become a house flipper. Like, are you crazy? Like, you don't even need a degree for that. But I'm like, don't worry, it's it's gonna work out. Um, so uh got into the house flipping space, uh, joined a company called Express Home Myers based in the DC area. And I remember the first summer we were like, we were like crushing it. We were doing like 50, 60 flips at a time. Thought we we're gonna be making all this money. But like all the money we thought we we're going to make on these deals, we ended up losing in construction. Uh -huh. Okay. Flipping doesn't scale. You can do one or two and keep them on budget on track. But if you're doing 50, 60 at a time, uh, it doesn't scale. Uh, so then I discovered wholesale and I'm like, this is such a better model. Why not just do this? You know, I remember the CEO and the other founder at the time, they're like, you, you'd be losing half the money on the table. Like, why would we do that? I'm like, yeah, but your cash conversion cycles would shrink. Like, well, we'd never be able to sell all the deals. There's not enough buyers. I'm like, well, trust me, I'll find buyers for these things. If they're priced right, the market will always find a buyer. Um, so they don't really have much of a choice. So we just switched the whole company over to wholesaling. And, um, you know, within a few months, we were doing million dollar months and um, doing it with a very small team. So I think we're probably the first people in the country to do that. And um, That's amazing. And then we hey, ran so into the dispo problems. And we can dive into that. So you That's, actually went inside a, you actually work on the field by being part of this, uh, it was a flipping company that you actually helped them understand the finances and the scalability of, because you use basically what you have learned in Harvard, in a sense. Yeah, and in a way I did. Like I knew there was only two metrics that mattered. Number one, what is your return on ad spend? For every dollar you plug in, how many dollars are you getting back? And number two was your cash conversion cycle. When you spend a dollar, how many days does it take you to get back that money? Now, the problem with flips is your cash conversion cycle gets stretched out way too far. Okay. Now, if you can shrink in that, like bring it down from six, eight months down to like 60, 90 days and, and, and then get a really high return on ad spend. Let's say you're getting $10 back for every dollar you plug in. I can plug in $10,000 turn it into hundred thousand dollars in 60 to 90 days. Like there's not a hedge fund in the plan that taxes their money that fast. It's the most beautiful business model in America today. And, and then you go shave off 30, plug in 30, go to 300 on the next cash conversion cycle, then shave off 50, plug 50 and go to 500, then shave off hundred, plug hundred in, go to a million. And so four cash conversion cycles is all it takes to take $10,000 and turn it into a million dollars a month. Yeah. And, and so you were able to help them shift to this business model to really see them. Uh, you mentioned that th there was ad spend involved. So at the beginning, when you got into this company, they were, I'm assuming they were running advertising. What type of advertising were they running? We were doing everything because it was one of those things where like nothing was really being tracked that well. I mean, they had like call rail phone numbers set up, but like nothing was really being analyzed or anything. 
So they were doing radio, they were doing television, uh, I think even newspapers at one point, bandit signs, uh, car deck holes, um, tons of direct mail. We're doing up to, I think uh, our peak, we're doing quarter million direct mail pieces a month. And then of course, uh, Facebook ads and Google ads. Okay. So the works, literally you name it, we were doing it. Now, the thing is, if you want to make a business scalable, you can't be a jack of all trades. This is a mistake I see so many businesses making. They try to dabble at the high level on like a million different marketing channels, which is exactly what was happening. Now, all these marketing channels work. Some of them are more scalable and less scalable than others. And some of them get you a higher return ad spend and a lower return ad spend than ours. The most scalable one with the highest return on ad spend and lowest emission returns um, overall, like balancing all those factors in is definitely Google ads by far. And so instead of trying to be a jack of all trades, what we did is I recommend we cut off most of the other ones and then focus primarily on digital. Because like, I mean, if you're doing texting and cold calling, like you, it's kind of like the necessary evil when you're first getting started because you have tons of time and you have no money. You can't afford to run Google or Facebook ads. So you kind of have to like just pound the phone and suck it up until you get you, you get money. And then now you start trading money instead of trading your time. But with uh, if you let's say you're doing 500 leads a month, texting and calling, if you wanted to double to a thousand leads a month, well, you have to you have to buy twice as much data, skip trace twice as much data, uh, hire twice as many people, train twice as many people, manage twice as many people. Like that's really hard to do. Like earlier today, I was on a call with a team and they had like seven cold callers and they're doing like a hundred thousand to 150,000 a month, which is like, okay, it's not great. It's like, you know, you're just kind of proving your model up and they want to go to a million a month. I'm like, well, you would need, um, actually they had eight. So I'm like, so if you wanted 10 X, you would need more than 10 X is mean you'd need at least a hundred cold callers. So do you envision yourself building a, a call center with a hundred cold callers in the next year? Yeah. Uh, hell no. Okay. So you need to start learning Google ads and getting digital rolling. And the, the beautiful thing about this, whenever, whenever you actually say that is one of the most scalable model is that, for example, in my, in our experience as an agency, we, we actually see whenever you put more ad spend in Facebook ads, it could shed the bed. It actually just could just explode. The campaigns just go, go bad and you have to gradually do it. Still the algorithm could go bad. And for people that don't know what I'm listening to, it's like Facebook ads is like you're spreading a, a you're you're having a a nozzle uh, uh just going hard into whatever it is that you want to target. Let's say you're targeting the county, a county, Orange County, and yeah. uh, Orange County is what you want, or the whole and the entire state. Let's say of uh, Florida, and you want to put more budget into it. This nozzle will 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 not expand at the same rate as the water flows. It's not going to go. At, it's not going to expand at the same rate, and it could yeah. potentially start leaking. So that leak is is what is called the. I want to say the emission returns. Yeah, exactly, and it's going to creep up. Uh, but Google, what the beautiful thing about Google is because it's a, it's more it it, it it's more of a intent based uh, marketing. Hundred so, percent. People yeah. have the intention to come to the to the to the place, all right, to this Google search, and well, you're basically buying real estate online in 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 Google. You're basically telling Google, "I want to be placed in your search bar in your on your first page, uh, so that I can show what I can do for my clients." And what Google will give you, you know, the placement. It will, it will actually give you the placement if you're spending more. Well, there is a higher chance that you will win that bid in being in the first. Um, and you can go up and down in, in your ad spend as easy as, as you know, as just click into buttons. So yeah. that's why it's so, so easy to go up in and scale, let's say, from $100 a day to $300 a day on Google advertising because it actually, it, 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 the nozzle, it's, it's a, it's, it's actually a flexible nozzle. It's not, yeah. it's not like Facebook that it's, it's actually just very, very solid. So yeah, hundred percent. Now there is, there is one issue you run into. This is what we ran into. 
Mm -hmm. So all, all marketing channels have diminishing returns. Google has probably the least diminishing returns, you know, for each dollar we increase, are we getting the same or are we getting less than the last dollar? Um, so that's why it's really beautiful and it's very scalable. I don't need to hire a lot of employees. I just like, if I want to double my lead flow, I double my budget, maybe throw a little bit extra on. Now the challenge is if you're based only in one market. So when we started off, we were based just in the, the DMV area. So essentially DC or sorry, Northern Virginia, Southern Maryland in a market, there are only so many searches per month. So you can get to the point if you're just focused just on one market where you kind of max out a market. And like that market was maxed out probably in like the like 750,000 to like 1.5 million per month range, you know, um, of what like total assignment fees that would be possible based off the search terms. Um, We would test this. Like one of the tests we ran is we took our marketing budget on Google ads and we just doubled it straight up, doubled it to see what kind of boost it would give us. And it only went up like, I don't know, like 20% the lead flow. So we knew we we're kind of like at the max there. So then we're thinking about, it, we're like, okay, we want to keep on growing. So why don't we do this? Instead of doing just a million a month in one market, why don't we do 5 million a month in five markets? Okay. So let's go tack on five, four other, other markets and run and do the exact same thing in those other markets. And we tried that and we got absolutely slaughtered. <laughs> What do you mean? <laughs> so what's interesting is like, like uh, we had friends that were in these markets that were doing really well. But when we went in, we wouldn't do really well. Conversely, when they came into our market, we'd be doing really well at our market, but they do like, what is this like foreign market thing that is really driving your performance of whether or not you can actually move deals? So I was thinking about it for the last few years and it really came down to I think two primary factors. I mean, there's a few different things that impact it. There's too many, two primary factors that really drove it. Number one is that we were mispricing stuff. So when you go and you go to these workshops, real estate guru workshops, you know, they teach you how to price them. And they say, you know, take the ARV, do 70% minus repairs. So we're just like playing it safe, doing 70% minus repairs. The 70% ARV across the board is we're moving to these markets. The problem is if you go do that in like LA, like nothing sells that cheap in LA. You're going to lose every single deal. Conversely, if you go to middle America and you try to do that in some areas of middle America, you'll be overpriced and you won't be able to, the buyers will be like, dude, man, we don't buy anything that high. Like we want 50 cents, 60 cents on the dog. So we're, we're number one, we're mispricing. And even within a city, like within a city, each pot, there's different pockets in the city that investors are expecting different discounts in. Yeah. Okay. In a bad area, they were expect a much bigger discount than in like the suburbs, you know. So um, that was the first thing. Like in our home market, we understood all those pockets just intuitively what stuff was going to go for, um, just from doing hundreds and hundreds of deals. And then we went to these other markets we're mispricing. So that was factor number one. Factor number two is we didn't know who had our money. Okay, um, this is really important. If you want to make money, you got to figure out who's got your money and go find them and get get it from them. Okay. Yeah. Essentially dispo. Okay. So in our home market, we know who had money, who didn't have money, who was going to screw us over and try to daisy chain our deal or circumvent us with the buyer. Like we knew how the good players were, the bad players. If we wanted to move a deal, you know, we could get on the phone and move that deal the same day, sometimes within a few hours. Then we go out to like Denver and like Mobile, Alabama, and we don't know anyone. We don't know who the big players are. We don't know who the bad players are. And, uh, it just made displaying deals really hard. Yeah. So one of the things that actually people do, if, if let's say they want to start going to another market or for, for some reason, they find a, a seller that has a property yeah. in a market that for them is unknown. This has happened a lot. Yeah. Um, usually the best practices, the best, I want to say best practices because this is what's recommended. Mm-hmm. It makes sense. Um, is to make a lot of connection with people on Facebook, Facebook groups, uh, try to try to try to do JV deals with other individuals that are there uh, because they have buyers. And then, you know, in this side, continuously find your, your buyers, people that have your money um, for that deal that you locked up <laughs> in that in that in that area that you're not really familiar to yeah. uh, or or potentially. Post it, post it in, in Craigslist, uh, post it in, in, in Facebook yeah. Marketplace. Spray and all pray. This, 
Exactly. Really All this spray and pay, pray kind of You can things. do it better though. So that's what exactly. we were doing. That's what we were doing. We we're doing the spray and pray. So this is like up until now, this has been the only thing you could do. So up until now, you could go on like PropStream or Propelio and they will give you a list of like cash, cash buyers. Okay. Yeah. Now the problem is just because there's a few problems with, with that data set. Um, one of the initial problems is just because someone bought something for cash doesn't mean that they're an investor. So for example, um, my wife, her family is Persian. They just buy everything in cash. Yeah. <laughs> I've never bought a real estate investment property ever, but like when her mom bought her house, she bought it in cash because that's just like their culture. Okay. That's right. If you call her up, ask if she's interested in an off market deal, she'll have no idea what the hell you're talking about. Yeah. Okay. So you're going to have a, just because someone bought something in cash doesn't mean it, they're actually an investor. Also, a lot of like the high volume flippers, they don't actually buy with cash. A lot of them actually will get financing. Um, so there's a lot of times where, you're missing out on a lot of the deals that are happening that you don't see, especially those, those really good buyers. Um, so we would go on a prop stream, skip trace, try to find buyers that way. Number one. Um, but that didn't solve the pricing problem. And then it was like, sometimes we'd hit it with a buyer. Sometimes we wouldn't. Um, and when we did hit it with a buyer, we wouldn't really know if that buyer bought one deal or bought a hundred deal. We didn't know how good they were. Right. So sometimes we get jacked up right before the deal closed. Someone tried to screw us and we're not putting their EMD or whatever. A bunch of different tricks people try to play. They'll jack up your deals and you get enough deals jacked up and all of a sudden your, your return ad spend is falling through the floor. Um, and then the second way is, yeah, go paste, post on like Facebook, Craigslist, like all of that and just try to spam as many people as you can and just like hope that you hit it. Now, at InvestorLift, uh, I was thinking about these approaches and how they weren't really satisfactory. They weren't really getting the job done. And I, I was talking to some, some of my friends and I'm like, I was thinking about, um, I heard from one of my friends working in Silicon Valley. He said, did you know that Facebook has a profile for every single American? Whether you're signed up for Facebook or not, like pretty much as soon as you're born, Facebook builds a profile for you. What they do is they start going to data brokers like Axiom, for example. Um, you know, every time you sign up for like a dating app or whatever, uh, and it's free, it's free because they're selling your data. They're selling it to data brokers and they'll go and start buying data on you and building this ghost profile for you on Facebook. Cause their whole philosophy is if we don't have you yet, we're eventually going to get you. And when we get you, we want to be able to monetize you right away and show you relevant ads. Yeah. Okay. Relevant ads from us down here. <laughs> yeah. Sell your house fast. Right. <laughs> So I was thinking about that. And I'm like, that's kind of creepy from like a big brother level, like that people are, are your Facebook is doing that. I'm like, but I appreciate the creativity. And imagine if you could take that and you could apply it to wholesalers or not wholesalers, but to real estate investors. Imagine if you had a data set that had every real flip, every real investment deal that happened in America. And then imagine if, for each of those buyers, you had a ghost profile. And on that ghost profile, you had all their deals that they've ever done. Address, when they bought it, when they sold it, how long they held it for, what they bought it for, what they sold it for, gross profit, everything that they'd ever done. And then imagine if you could give those buyers almost like a credit score based on their activity, based on the actual deals that they're doing. And then imagine if you could go into a system and you could type in an address and have a pop, a map pop out and see all those deals, all those buyers, filter by buyer score, and go see, here's all the top buyers in this market. And then click into those profiles and get the registered agents for those companies, the cell phone numbers of those registered agents, and then give them a call and then have a map open right in front with all of their deal metrics, all of their deals that they've done. And let's say I'm trying to sell a, a deal of 123 Maple Street, and I see Sarah just bought 1234 Maple Street, six months ago for 200 grand, sold it for 350. And I call up Sarah, I, I say, hey, I saw you just bought this property on Maple Street. I just bought the property next door. I saw you made you know 150 gross spread on your last deal. I'm asking about the same price for my property. Are you interested in taking a look at it? What do you think Sarah's gonna say? Absolutely, let me, let me go and see the property. And probably she's gonna be like, hey, this might be another good deal for my portfolio. 
She's probably been searching. She probably just made a bunch of casts from her last deal. She's been yeah. searching for another deal and you just teed it up. She already knows the neighborhood. She probably already knows the house. She's active in this area. She was successful before. Her risk is very low. And then not only that, but like the real buyers, they get called all the time. They get bombarded by us wholesalers. And most of wholesalers that like call me, they're like, uh, hey, are you interested in deals? And it's just like, click, you know. But if someone calls me up and is like, hey, Robert, I saw you bought 16 deals last year. Uh, I got one three blocks away from one you just did and made 200 gross spread on. Are you interested in, in, in taking a look at my deal? And, and like, of course, I'm going to say yes. Like, yeah. and then I'm going to go save you and my contacts with right beside my grandma and my aunt and put a special ringtone because every time you call me, you're bringing me money. Yeah. I'm going to say like, hey, this guy did his absolute research. I don't know what the hell he did. He found some information about the stuff that I've done, but it's so relevant to what I'm trying to do. Let's actually become a business partner or, you know, let's just try to do business with this person. I mean, this is how I would think, right? If I were actively Absolutely. buying and holding or just getting properties for flips, yeah. this is, this is, this is exactly the right people that I want to work with, right? People that yeah. really go out of their way to, to make sure that I have my pipeline full. Yeah. Which is awesome, man. I think you're, I think you're in the path. I want to say you're in the path of, of, of doing a, the next either tender for real estate investors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No more spray and pray. Like the thing is <laughs> spray and pray, like it annoys everyone. Everyone gets drowned. And like my whole hypothesis is like the best guy for a deal is the one that just made a killing down the street. So let's go call everyone in a two mile radius and let's go stack some offers. Like I remember the first time, so we call this feature God mode. The first time I built it, I tried to own one of my deals. The deal was already overpriced. And I pushed it out, but then I put it like an insane buy it now price. I got 13 offers in two hours on the deal. Six of them at my insane buy it now price. I made 46 grand in two hours selling the, the deal above what I should have sold it for. And then, and then the lady that initially signed up the contract, the next day she never submitted her EMD payment to title. So I call her up like, what's going on? Your breach of contract, your EMD payment is supposed to be in. She's like, uh, uh, yeah, so I was looking for the numbers again with my husband and uh, I think we overpaid for this one. So can you please let me go? Like normally most wholesalers are in a situation where they just jump on the first offer they get. So normally I'd be like up the creek. But like inside of InvestorLift, one of the things we do is when people submit their offers, we ask them for proof of funds. So I just clicked down the list of the other five uh, buy it now offers that I had and opened up other proof of funds. And I saw a guy on there had a $35, $35 million in his bank account. So I called him up. I'm like, hey, what's up, Parker? And he's like, hey, what's up, man? I'm like, hey, I got you want this deal? He's like, yep. I'm like, okay, why are the MD right now? Why are the MD? That deal was done, made 46 grand. And I wasn't beholden to my buyer. The problem is a lot of people become like employees of their, they get a few buyers and they just sell over and over and over again and they don't get bidding wars going. You got to get bidding wars going. Otherwise, you are essentially an employee of your buyers. You become That's basically right. like a contractor for your buyer. And they make all the money. They muster you out of all their earnings. And what you got to do is you got to flip that. And the way to flip that is to stack more offers. And the way to stack more offers is get in front of more high quality buyers. Now, that, it's really interesting when you look at the data on what happens when you do this. So the average company that joins InvestorLift has an average assignment fee when they join of less than 20000 But last mm -hmm. year with like hundreds of millions of dollars of properties sold, the average assignment fee was $36,000, way, way above the national average. So how do you go from 20 to 36? You go from 20 to 36 by creating bidding wars. Yeah. Right? By yeah. putting a buy it yeah. now price and pushing 100%. up 5, 10, 15 grand. And I'm telling you, it, the funny thing is, how much extra work is it to make 35000 off of a deal is it is to make 20000 It's just a matter of making people fight for it. I mean, it's just a matter of... Yeah, a couple of phone just, calls. It's the yeah, same exactly. process. Same process. Yeah. And one of them, you're making almost twice as much money. Exactly. So, as a marketer, this is great because what that does to your marketing numbers is like people always get fixated on cost per lead. And one of the ways our top, top companies crush it is by not caring about cost per lead at all. We don't give a crap mm -hmm. what the cost per lead is. Irrelevant. We'll make fun of people that focus on it. All we care about is return on ad spend. I'm fine paying $5,000 for a lead 
if I'm closing one in three of those leads and I'm making $50,000 on the deal, you know, 15 grand in $50,000 out, like. Absolutely. That's spend as much as I, you know, as much as I want. That's right away a return of investment. And actually one thing that you actually have mentioned is it, it, it really, it really amazes me that you went above and beyond, not only creating a platform, which we're going to dive into this uh, because the platform allows people to find the buyers and kind of have a very user, very user friendly experience that where they can actually, instead of a spray and, and you know, a spray and pray, they can actually find relevant information about these people, these prospects. But also you went ahead and went upon and beyond created a system and trained the, your people into the bidding war mechanism. Because when you do, for example, acquisitions, uh, acquisitions is the first problem that they're going to face. And a lot of not super experienced investors are fixing this. Even ex experienced investors, they still have to train their acquisitions people. But that's the first problem. Once that problem is actually fixed, okay, once that problem is actually fixed, if they're working with a property that is outside of their territory or never had a buyer before, the second problem is in the other side and back end, okay? And also requires a sales process and a marketing process. So both acquisitions and dispositions require a marketing and sales process. So you, we got to remember that this is not really a real estate game. This is more of a marketing and sales game. And yep. that's what you actually have provided. Now, how many members do you currently have, man, in your investor lift uh, so community? We have 1,200 users. And I will tell you, the ones that have the most success are the ones that straight up recognize this is not a real estate game. It's a marketing and sales game. Okay, it's 100% marketing and sales. You just happen to be dealing with houses. You're not even really actually buying and selling houses. You're selling contracts, basically right. options on houses. Uh, you're closer to like a, a, a like a stock market option broker than you are than you are a real estate uh, agent or whatever. So uh, yeah, like if you look at like I remember if you ever watch HGTV Flip or Flop with uh, Target and Christina. Yeah, I was working with their team on getting them rolling with wholesaling. They weren't really wholesaling at all. The last year they got started rolling on wholesaling, like month one. They did like 40,000, then they did like 200, I think 500, then a million, then like 1.3, just like summer through fall. And then um, when we first opened InvestorLift to the public, February of this year, I actually had the, the head of Tark's team on our call. And he has a team of five guys. Do you want to guess how much money he put on the board in January with just five guys on his team? Uh, I want to give you a million. 2.7 million. Oh, 2.7 million. Wow, with only five people, man. <laughs> the power yeah. of investor lift. You're lifting, <laughs> yeah, it, lifting you up. Here's the thing. Even if you don't have investor lift, okay? I don't, I'm not, I don't want to be one of those people that's like, oh, buy my product, buy my product, buy my, you know, of like, course. you know, it, it makes your life easier. If you want to get it, check it out. Um, get.investorlift.com, check it out. But like, I'm going to drop some bombs here regardless of what you're doing, if you're just getting started. So what we realized is, you know, it's a sales and marketing business. So uh, when we got forced to join the team, um, the company was specifically looking for someone that had experience growing sales and marketing teams, not a real estate agent, not a real estate broker, sales and marketing guy. So Forrest, his last business, he grew his sales team to over a thousand people selling basically almost like GoDaddy type products. Okay. And I think he sold that company. He retired and Tark brought him out of retirement to go help build up the wholesaling business. Now, when the top teams hire for salespeople, um, what the top team, what the, what the amateurs do is they go hire a bunch of real estate agents and that never works out. Real estate agents are usually very lazy. Um, they're not usually that conscientious. And, uh, they're typically not like, I'm going to get so much flack for saying this, but typically not the greatest closers. Okay. Yeah. 
there's always exceptions, but in general, that's what I've seen in the data is the companies that uh, have real estate agents that they're hiring have atrocious closing numbers that are just pathetic. So um, what the top teams typically do is they'll recruit salespeople from industries that have nothing to do with real estate. Like I always tell people, I'm like, you're like, how would you find a really great sales agent? Here's what I do. I go to BMW pretending that I want to buy a BMW, even though I have no intention of buying BMW. I got a Tesla Model X. I love it. I have no intention of buying BMW. But I'll keep on going from BMW dealership to BMW dealership until some guy almost makes me buy a car because he's that good at his sales job. Then what I'll do is I'll go poach that person and get them working on my team. Um, actually, Express, the first, the top performing guy that we had at Express in terms of close rate, and revenue generated for the business was from BMW. So I'm not just like making this up. So people from like any, any industry that has a lot of high frequency sales where they have a lot of high frequency sales experience. So like car sales, window sales, roofing sales, things like that. Those are going to be the types of people you want to bring in. And then when you bring those people in, they don't need to know anything about real estate. You Most people make the serums way too complicated. The only two things that really matter is like, do they have motivation? Do they have equity? So when that lead comes in, you're talking to them on the phone. It's like, do they have motivation? Do they have equity? No. Okay. Uh, we're not the best fit for you, ma'am. I apologize. But, you know, we have this realtor that we work with that would probably be a better option for you. Refer it to the realtor. Get the referral fee. Put that back into your marketing budget. Cover your marketing budget. Now, if they are a good fit, then you fire it over to Deal Desk. And Deal Desk is just one guy that you just need one guy that knows how to comp stuff. He just sits there all day comping stuff, and giving the team their max level offer. Punches the max level offer and then target dispo price as well. It fires it back to that sell person. That salesperson gets in the system, calls them up. Hey, ma'am, looks like I can give you $250,000 for your house. How's that sound? And as long as they can get it under that max level offer, they got a deal. If not, again, refer it out. So just keeping things really, really simple. We're not trying to do a lot of complicated stuff like creative finance. And we're just like pump the leads in, close them as quickly and efficiently as possible. Don't try to jam the cash offer down everyone's throat. But when we do get a deal, um, you know, put it through a streamlined process. It's like making a Big Mac, you know, like run your business like McDonald's. Step one, two, three, four, very simple. And then that's how you can pump insane volume through a very, very small team and set record breaking numbers that no one else in the country is even getting close to. Wow. Now, uh, this team now, they have leverage. Uh, a marketing channel to bring in the leads. I'm, I'm going to be assuming that that is USA-wide PPC. Is that right? Uh, no, that's actually, they're actually in two markets. They're in Southern California and Oklahoma. So what they do is they generate leads uh, in Southern California and they wholesale there. Now, keep in mind, Southern California is huge. Like I think about $16 billion was made last year by wholesalers and flippers and the Southern California market. So like, there's plenty of deals to go around. Um, but then like, if you're really smart, what you don't want to do is have all these assignment fees and be taxed on them all. So what we'll do yeah. is we're on a secondary campaign in Tulsa, Oklahoma, which is a great rental market, right? Um, LA is not a good rental market at all. But then we'll run a second campaign in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Anything that meets the 1% rule where you know the, the rent for that property is like 1% of whatever the purchase price is. So you buy the house for hundred thousand dollars, the rent, it rents for a thousand. Buy the house for hundred and fifty thousand dollars, rents for fifteen hundred. Anything that meets that criteria by sight unseen, take the assignment fees, put down deposits down on all these houses, like hundreds and hundreds of houses, put your 20% in, you lock in interest rates that are lower than inflation for the next 30 years. And now you got all of your income protected. You're also gonna have all this depreciation now that's you're going to be able to log against your income for the next years and years and years. And these properties are spinning off insane cash flows every year and they'll be appreciating. It's like, that's how you go become a billionaire. That's how you can go use a wholesaling business and use that as your ATM to go build like a hundred million, 200 million or even billion dollar real estate empire. Yes. How many of your members, yourself. how many of your members actually, uh, own a, a large number of units or large number of uh, real estate assets and I think they have help. I couldn't give you exact number, but I do see uh, there's a very common trend where 
people, wholesaling is a means to an end, right? It's a very transactional business and transactional businesses, you're going to get tired of them pretty quickly. Okay. It also suffers from high turnover because when you get rock star performers, what they do is they'll stay for one to maybe maximum three years. Once they feel like they understand the game enough to go out on their own, they're going to go out on their own because they, they're, the financial incentive is there. They know they can make 10, 20 times more money working on their own than they can working as employees. So you're going to have always be retraining people. So it gets pretty tiring. So what a lot of guys will do is they'll bring in an operator, like a COO, to run the operation for them. And then they'll step out and they just have that COO or CEO take over the operations for them. And then they'll step out to go then start spending those assignment fees. So you get it running like a well-oiled machine. Yeah. That's your ATM now. And then you step out, bring in an operator. So you step out and start working on commercial, start working on venture capital investments, whatever it is, um, some other level of investing all that cash. But you got to get the money first before you can become move up to that investor level, you know. Um, people that go straight to the investor level, they don't have any capital to play with. So, uh, it's a little bit more challenging. So, I mean, Nick Perry is a prime example. You had him on the show, I think last week, Nick yeah. Perry brought in Brandon, promoted him to CEO. Brandon runs the whole operation out of Austin, Texas. Meanwhile, uh, Nick just moved out to Miami. He's balling out in Miami, buying apartment buildings and having a good time. And the wholesaling business is the ATM that's going to feed that. That's right. We, we're actually taking the wholesaling business as a cash cow. Um, and I think that this model really, really works because at the end of the day, with wholesaling, you're, you're generating lots of revenue and you're having a profitable model. But, but like what, what Robert said, ultimately, what, what is it that is going to stay? What is it going to stay for the long run? Maybe you have a well-oiled business and it keeps running and running and running. But the moment that marketing actually stops, everything could potentially also stop unless you have a very well organic way of generating leads and they come in by themselves. Um, but whenever you're actually acquiring, acquiring assets, acquiring properties uh, and having the same methods that Nick Perry does, for example, and that Robert just mentioned, then you're going to you're going to be having a a wealth making generation that mm -hmm. you're that you're going to have and yeah. that's exactly how we should be aiming i mean it's completely fine for example right now robert i'm pretty sure he has his SaaS company generating him cash cow and it's yeah, I need a, I need a few thousand apartments to cover what i make on SaaS. But, SaaS exactly is, SaaS but is now beautiful exactly but now uh, of course, he has to have units, apartment, buildings, whatever that is, to off not only offset those taxes, yeah. <laughs> right? But yeah, like, I'll give you generate. an example. Like, I'm wiring fifty thousand dollars today to go buy a note on a yeah. property that it's just like I have a bunch of cash in the bank that I don't like five percent, six percent interest rates. I need to deploy it fast. So, like, I have a guy that originates notes and he sells them to me. And then he takes a portion of the profits. I take a portion of the profits, but they return like the annualized return is insane. It's like two to three X what the top hedge funds in, in the world make. And if someone ever didn't perform on their note, I could just like, you know, reclaim that property, push it out through investor lift and go sell it off. So like my risk is because of my SaaS, my risk is very downsized on doing those types of investing activities. So um, yeah, you just gotta be smart. Like, again, you gotta start with those. One problem I've seen a lot of guys doing is they'll go the opposite direction. So there's, there's two types of mistakes you can make. One mistake is you do all wholesaling, you make all this money and then you go spend it on Lambos and Ferraris and stuff and don't really build anything. You go wholesale for five, 10 years hustling. Like I love Rafael Vargas, but he, he's like prime example, like just Lambos, private jets, like all that, just like bling, bling. Cash comes in, beginning of the month, it's gone by the end of the month, okay? Uh, you don't want to be that guy. But then also, I know another class where, like, they don't wholesale at all. And they, like, they don't make any real monthly cash flow. And they're, like, living in their mom's basement and, like, trying to, like, like arbitrage these, like, different creative deals together to get $100 a month here and $100 a month there. And it takes them, like, 
their entire twenties to get to like 10 grand a month, you know, and like, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but like, I've seen <laughs> yeah. that happen too, where people are so like long-term that they don't just get to like enjoy making some cash now. So I think I get the money. Number one, this is my best advice. Wholesaling is all about getting the money. So go get the money and then don't spend it. Okay. Take half max live on that and then go set aside the other half for other investments. And you do that for five years and you're going to be set up. Mike, you can't, you can't really do that for five years and not be a multimillionaire by the end of five years. Yeah. Yeah. I believe, uh, my, so I have a coach. I'm not sure if uh, your listeners have a coach. I have multiple, multiple coaches. I have one, his name is Pace Morvey and his yeah. partner, Cody, um, they own several, several amount of units, properties all over, and they keep doing wholesaling and they keep getting this long-term vision too, but it's a mix. It's a hybrid. Okay. Now as wholesalers, we, you guys are going to see YouTube videos coming from this, uh, YouTube creators, content creators, maybe gurus, maybe coaches to tell you to start wholesaling business and not do Forex, not do crypto, not do you know, uh, agency not do all this other stuff because wholesaling has a higher profit margin and it also brings in nice amount of deals. But reality is that, is that it's going to be hard. Once you actually master it, you're going to generate cash. But once you generate the cash, then you got to have a smart way after hustling so much, uh, getting that company running to make that money work for you. That's where Robert Kiyosaki's actually explanation of his book comes in, right? Where you actually are getting the money to work for you. Yeah. So that's one huge thing, man. Rob, Robert, uh, this is so great, but I do, I am very, very uh, curious about the testing phases, making sure that your product is so quality and it actually works the way it's supposed to be. And anyone that is a stupid tech comes in and can actually use it because <laughs> I've had several members that they, you know, they come in and they want to do Facebook ads. They want to do Google ads. We provide yeah. them a CRM, but then they, I want to call it their tech dumb. <laughs> and yeah. I'm sorry, but it, this, it is, it is the way it is. Yeah. Uh, and now they're dealing with tech you, during your testing phases. What have you done to make it easy? for people to really yeah. do this. I mean, ultimately what it comes down to is like a lot of people that try to get into the tech space, what they do is they make the mistake of coming up with in their mind what a product should be, spending years building it, and then bring it to market and be like, guys, check out what I built. And then half the time, no one understands it or no, and then no one buys it. You know, like that's like classic software flop one-on-one. Go raise a bunch of venture capital this great idea that you think everyone's going to love and your mom loves and like, don't trust your family. If your family is telling you, Oh, I love this. Okay. Be like, okay, you want to buy it? Okay. Give me your credit card. That's the real test. See, he'll pre-buy it. Actually with investor lift, I sold investor lift before I ever even built it. Okay. So I created a pitch deck with pictures of what it would look like. And I said, this is what it'll look like. This is what it'll do. This is what I think it could earn you. And this is what it's going to cost. And this is when you're going to get delivered six months from now. And so I pre-sold the contracts on it and I took that money, hired the team to build it up front. And I already, the customer already knew what it was going to look like, had already provided feedback on what changes they wanted and designed and iterated on it before a single line of code was ever written or even anyone was hired to even build it. So then when it got delivered, like everyone knew exactly what they're getting and I didn't have to go like once it's built, it's so much a thousand times more expensive to fix it afterwards. So that's number one for just getting started if anyone's thinking about building a SaaS project. But number two is then when you incrementally work on it, like what we do is we just constantly talk to our customers all day long about what they like, what they don't like, and then take all that feedback. I synthesize it and then feed it back to the team to figure out what changes need to be made. So it's just the product just evolves every single day. Every single day, there's new features, new functionality we're rolling out. We're rolling out AI next week the ai is sick absolutely sick um ai is like Elon artificial Musk. intelligence yeah just, it, it, there's a, a really good quote by him he said if if your competitor is racing to build ai and you're not they will absolutely crush you okay i'll tell you why 
the average human can look at only a super intelligent human will look at nine data points to be able to synthesize a decision. The average human is about seven data points, but if you're really smart, you can go up to nine. Our AI looks at every single property sold in America, every single buyer profile, and then every single interaction with the system that any buyer has made with our system. We spun off like 28 million data points just uh, last month. Looks at all of that. And then in 1.5 seconds, gives you a list of the top 25 buyers for that deal. Wow. Single click. Like humans, there's, you could have literally an army of humans. You could take a gymnasium of humans and give them a month to try to synthesize all the data. And like, you probably wouldn't get even as good a result. And now you this can do 1.5 like seconds. So, so if you're very close to being an Uber, kind of like an Uber in, in this space. Yeah. Where people just meet up. Yeah, just the platform, you, can just, you know, a platform. I, almost more like, I mean, it's like the same kind of thing as like eBay or Zillow. You know, we're just like the yeah. platform layer. People can post deals. People can buy deals. It's a marketplace. I have zero interest in doing any deals. I think it's a conflict of interest if I do deals. I'm like, come buy my tech and give me your, put your data in my system. Oh, by the way, I'm going to do deals. Like, so I'm, I'm not going to do deals anymore. Um, and um, yeah, I just want to be, be the marketplace. And there's been a few people that have tried it before, but the problem was they let the noobs on. When you let the noobs on, the system gets crushed. Like my house yeah. deals was like, like when I was first getting started in real estate investing back in like 2015. Yeah. My house deals was like the investor lift back then. It was like the hottest thing. Like everyone was like, oh my God, this is crazy. Like, but then they let anyone post deals. And then so you had all the noobs flocking on posting junk deals. So now it's known as like my house deals is where house go where deals go to die. Cause it's just yeah. where all the noobs go. But there's no real buyers looking at any of those deals. So you can put post something there, but you're never gonna get an offer. Um, so what we do is try to focus on and getting the more experienced investors on and actually anti-sell. Um, someone just said, I still use it to this day. Awesome. Have you got any offers though? That's my question. <laughs> <laughs> Let me know if you've actually got any offers off there. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, my, my whole focus is just get all the mega buyers. The, Cause those guys are the ones that pay the most that earn you the highest assignment fees. So like, uh, you know, 50% plus of deals on investor are sold to mega buyers, like wall street buyers. Yeah, And those guys are paying sometimes 90 cents plus on the dollar. A mom pop shop is going to be giving you 70 cents on the dollar. A hedge fund is going to be giving you 90 cents on the dollar. The difference between those on an average deal is thousands of dollars. Oh, yeah. So wh who do you want to sell it to? You? So you're having plans of uh, getting hedge funds to utilize your platform? Yeah. We have one fund that's going to be buying just the first fund. I mean, we have 400 and some, but we have one like special deal with one that's pretty much committed to buying about $1.5 billion of homes through the platform over the next 12 months. Amazing. That's just the first one. How, how would you facilitate that? Uh, uh, there we go. There's the answer. No, I haven't. I need a vessel lift now. <laughs> <laughs> Facts. How yeah. would you facilitate the whole process? Because a lot of people don't even know what a hedge fund is, how to work with a hedge fund, for example. Would you be able to facilitate that process of understanding yeah. how to work with so them? You need to figure out, they're all, they all have their own unique things that they do. Okay, so like I, when I was in LA and I was doing deals in LA, we'd sell a lot to a fund um, called, we'd sell a lot to Wedgwood and SFR3. And like one of those funds, I can't remember which one, they require a mainline scope inspection. Okay, because if the main line is busted, that jacks up their, they're looking for a cap rate. Okay, and they're also looking to pump thousands of properties through the system. Yeah, they got to deploy capital, they make they make fees manage a portfolio of capital that gets deployed. So the faster they deploy capital, the more money they make. Okay, they're basically like fund managers. So they don't want construction jacking them up. So like with one of those, for example, you have to have a prelim, uh, preliminary scope inspection. So you just got to, if you want to sell it to them, you got to know that and get it done. Um, the one that we're bringing onto the system right now, uh, they, on their last fund, they bought 15,000 houses on their last fund and then packaged them up and sold them off to another big hedge fund. <laughs> um, and then started buying again in June. They bought 1,200 properties since June. And one of uh, the things that's been holding them back 
has been that they have to physically go and inspect each property because they got burnt on construction estimates before when they yeah. didn't go physically inspect a mot site on scene. So I was talking to them. I met with them in North Carolina a couple a couple weeks ago, and I said, "Okay, but what if you had Matterport? If you had Matterport, would you have to go see them?" Their response was, "No. If we had Matterport, that would be way better because then we have to orchestrate logistics." Any deals that come through with Matterport, we would prioritize 10x anything else because I could just have a guy at a desk that's a construction expert and he's just going through a feed of properties every day, looking at them, walking the property through that Matterport from his desk, looking at properties all across the country and then making offers on you know hundreds of deals, thousands of deals. So um, those are some tips is just like figure out what the ones are in there is that you're moving deals, number one. And then number two, figure out what the nuances of each of those funds are. That's awesome. Uh, our our members are, we're, I'm going to invite a special guest, I believe in the coming weeks, uh, and our members are going to have like kind of like a masterclass on how to leverage Open Door mm -hmm. and potentially also Zillow offers because a lot of, like you said, a lot of people will pay 95, 95, 97 percent. Yeah, the, on the, 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 the problem with those guys is those guys, a lot of times they make you actually purchase the property number one yourself. So you have to yeah. come up with the capital and actually go to closing and pay registration fee, title fees, all that stuff, all the closing fees. But then number two, like I think it was either Zillow or Open Door just came up with this new rule where you have to not just take title of it, but then actually hold it for 60 days. So you oh, got to really? go get a loan and mm -hmm. then go pay interest on it and then double close. You have all these fees. Um, so my goal is to go feed you guys. I mean, if you're on investor, I feed you guys some some better funds that don't put those. It's like open door at the end of the day. It's just Wall Street money with a nice, pretty website in front. It's yeah. the same thing as like a hedge fund buyer, except they're going direct to seller versus like these guys are going direct to wholesaler. That's pretty awesome, man. So for people that actually want to just reach out and figure out more, uh, people that are experienced, you said that you would really want to get people that lock up good deals, deals that do make sense. Um, how do they get a hold of you? And I believe we're going to have, you know, Esteban Andrade and Hessel Media are, are also going to have a landing page. Um, but how can people get a hold of you, just I questions or your team? I got something I'm going to hook you guys up with because I know a few people are asking about getting hooked up with uh, InvestLift. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to hook you guys up with something. Okay. If you guys go, am I able to s drop chats? Okay. Why don't you go drop this on chat, Esteban? Yep. If they go to get.investorlift.com, go there. And if you want to grab InvestorLift, I just created a new coupon code just now for Esteban to go hook you guys with, up with a special deal. So if you type in Esteban VIP, okay, Esteban VIP, um, Esteban, if you want to drop them in the chat, go ahead. Yeah. Um, that will unlock 10%. Okay. Give you guys a little discount. And then if you're on, I run onboarding calls every Tuesday and Thursday. So if you join me next week, Tuesday or Thursday, or, or whenever you're watching this, just let me know on the onboarding call that you watch this. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to hook you up with something that is really worth like it could be worth hundreds of thousands of dollars if you use it right. And that is um, I'm going to give you a thousand of my vetted cash buyers to get you rock and roll. A thousand right vetted away. cash buyers. Wow. And I'll, okay, throw awesome. a couple of my, I'll throw a couple of my favorite hedge fund buyers in there for you, too. What else Just can you drop here scared. for the listeners? Is there anything else? Anything? I know you can get something, man. I want to get I, I want to get them more. More yeah, <laughs> I mean, if you if 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 someone comes in from Esteban, I will I will make sure that you have like the best onboarding. So when you leave the onboarding call, you know exactly how to go crush it. There's a lot of guys that will get off onboarding and then pay for like the next two or three years of their license literally that afternoon because well, those they'll just jump on Facebook and like most people in the country don't know what InvestorLift is yet. I mean, we just went public. We've done three public demos. That's it. Okay. And by the way, there's a, a full demo on that page, get.investorlift.com. If you guys want to see the demo, watch that demo and stay till the end because that's when Tark's guy comes on and show, tells exactly how he got to 2.7 million a month with five guys. So the HGTV hey, guy, man. The HGTV yeah. guy is going to tell you. Yeah. So make sure to watch that if you want to really learn about it. But if you want to take action and do it, I mean, 
what some guys will do, even if they don't have marketing rolling, they'll just go get a license. And then because no one really knows what investor lift is right now, they'll go start hitting all the Facebook wholesaling groups and we they'll go find all the people pushing out deals, grab the address, go over into investor lift God mode and compare the numbers they see in God mode to what the wholesaler is asking for the deal on Facebook. And if they find that there's an arbitrage opportunity where maybe the wholesaler is asking a much lower than what people are actually paying, they'll call them up and be like, hey, man, I think I can move this for you and make you exactly what you're asking for or more. Do you want a JV with me? And then wow. they'll lock in a JV deal, hit God mode, call a few buyers, go JV that deal the same day. And then I remember, do you know Quentin Flores? Yes, uh, I know Quentin. Yep. Quentin Flores, I gave him a demo. And he was like, holy shit, this changes everything. <laughs> the next day, he went and registered a new LLC, uh, opened up a new bank account for that LLC, hired an entire new team, launched an entire new company with logo, branding, everything. In one day, he started his own dispo company where all he does is sell deals for his students and like people that watch his YouTube shows. And he texted me the next week. Um, I could even show you the text. He's like, bro, I just made $55,000 on one freaking JV. Um, on a That's JV, huge. 55 G's on it, JV. Let me see if I can find it. Um, so if you're like a network marketer, if you're a people person, if you know how to connect with others, if you really know and have uh, some sort of influence or just access to people, uh, it's good that you actually also can take advantage of this model. If you have a yeah. community, if you are a coach, if you have a course, whatever, and you have a pool of people and you want to help them, Investor Lift is huge for this as well. Yeah. And like, you got it. Here's the thing. This time next year, everyone in the country is going to know about it. Everyone in the country is going to be using it. In between now and then, there's going to be a lot of people that like people that are watching this right now that are going to like watch this and actually take action on it and make shit tons of money doing it. Okay. And then there's going to be the people that watch it and they're like, ah, yeah, maybe I'll think about that. Do it later. And then they're going to be watching their friends, like rolling around in new cars and stuff, building their businesses, building their teams, getting to the next level. And then they're going to be sitting around this time next year when everyone has investor lift. It's no longer really a huge game changing opportunity and be like, damn, I should have done, I should have jumped on that early. It's like, Bitcoin, you know, imagine if you jump on Bitcoin when no one knew about it, or you jumped on the Amazon stock when no one knew about it. The early adopters on anything always capture the majority of the earnings. Yes. Um, so if you're on this call, this is like literally like, I think the third or fourth time I publicly talked about investor left. So not so too like, many times. Not too many people even know, know about it. The buyers know about it, but not a lot of wholesalers know about it. So there's a big opportunity. The, it's not like we used to sell it for $10,000 a month. Now it's like... Four seventy nine a month plus ten percent off. You bill up. We bill up front, and again, that's to like keep the best people on. I want people that are doing two three deals a month. Um, but even if you're not doing two three deals a month, if you think you could JV two three deals a month, I mean, you would make your money back in the first. Think think about this. Deal. How much does it cost a VA to uh, help with this position? Probably the same thing, or just a little bit more. And that VA is doing the spray and pay. Uh, spray, spray and pray. So yeah. Investor Lift actually will help you leverage uh, technology, AI right now and everything uh, to to get you at this position. Your game is stronger in this position. So it's just, it's just a no-brainer. No-brainer for anyone that is in here. Uh, it's just for me, just makes sense. It will be a win-win situation. Yeah, absolutely. If you guys want to... Um, yeah, the question here, do you say four uh seventy-five a month? Four seventy-nine a month minus ten percent. So it brings it down, you know, whatever. Um, but it is billed annually. So if I go to S demand, I'll click buy now. Let me just double check, make sure this coupon code works. I just created it, it should work. So then VIP apply. Uh I spelled it wrong. Yeah, so normally it's like fifty seven hundred for the whole year. And then with the discount code I ho hook you guys up with, um, it brings it down to 5173 for the whole year. So you just make the pain once. What I would do is I would just go like invest the money and then go make it back Monday. I'm like just go find yourself a JV Monday. Go sell a deal Monday and go make the money back Monday.
Like yeah, it's we'll it's it not up. hard. Go JV a deal Monday, and then you have it free <laughs> for the rest of the year. Like you you were talking about uh, Leanne. Leanne, um, she didn't have the money to go buy it. So what she did is she sold uh, an enterprise license. So there is a level above this that unlocks once you start hitting a quarter million a month, three months in a row. It's called cartel boss level. And like all the biggest gurus in the country have that. Like Cody Sperber is on there, Tarko Musa, Carlos Reyes, Chris Jefferson, Tiffany Hine, Nick Perry, Corey Geary. Like you name it. Like every guru in the country is using that for their dispo. It's almost identical. It's almost identical to what you get for um, 479. It just has this one extra thing called cartel mode, which if you're doing less than quarter million dollars a month, you don't even need to worry about that right now. Okay. Once you get there, then I'll, I'll call you and I'll explain it to you and you'll be like, okay, that, that's cool. Makes sense. But she didn't have money for pro. So when she went and she found someone that was doing a quarter million a month, Reese Pennington texted me an intro, said, Hey, you should jump on a call with Reese. I did a demo for Reese. Reese signed up on the spot that day, wired me 36 G's for enterprise level. Then I wired her $7,000 the same day for a referral fee. We pay out 20% on the enterprise for referrals. And then, and then she bought it for 5,700 and then still had 13,000, 1,300 bucks in her pocket. So like, that's the kind of stuff that you got to be thinking like that to really be like a really successful investor. You got to get creative. If you can't afford something, never, here's the biggest thing in life. Never say, I can't afford something. Ask yourself, how can I afford this? Like, I want to buy an airplane right now. And you see this airplane right here? Yep. There's a two-year wait. List. I'm doing my pilot license right now. Right. There we go. It's called a vision jet. It's uh, the one jet in the world you can actually fly yourself is a pilot. So I'm doing my training for it. And my wife thinks I'm insane. She's like, Robert, you run a startup? And you want to buy a jet? <laughs> That's course. insane. And I'm like, well, here's the thing about jets. That thing, the payment on that would be thirteen thousand a month. A lot of money, right? But it's not crazy. It's not like a golf stream where you'd be paying one hundred and fifty thousand a month, thirteen grand a month. But I'm already spending five grand a month on like busy months already on travel, so I'm saving money there. But then also the company I'm doing my flight training at. Because these are so small and affordable and they can get in and out of small airports, they rent them out for organ transplants. So when oh. I'm not using it, I can rent it out for organ transplants. And then if I do that, they'll also handle all my, 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 my maintenance for me. There you go. You're doing like a little Turo model. And then I have <laughs> another guy that wants to go 50-50 on it. He just wants it available a few times a year to be able to show off some clients so then I can drop my cost and have there. And now I'm cash flow positive. But then also, then when I want to do big deals, like I want to go get in our hedge fund, sign up for InvestShift and, you know, uh, buying deals from all of you, making you guys all money. When I go down to meet them, I fly in my private jet. We go fly somewhere for lunch. Can you get, wrap it with an investor lift so it helps yeah, you? Yeah, I'm going to expense it. And then I'm also going to get depreciation off of it. Yes. Total rent, I could use section 179, accelerated depreciation, driving my tax down to zero. Like, you got to think creatively about any, you can get anything, absolutely anything in life. If you think about getting creative with how to structure things and how to get what you want. Like, I have friends that literally have bought tens of millions of dollars of apartments with like no credit and no cash and came into the game with like no experience, but they're just so freaking creative with how they bring together deals and structure things that like, they're just like, Hey, if I want it, I'm going to get it. It's just a question of how. So if you want to get investor lift, think about that. Uh, go do some referrals. If you need a referral code, let me know. I'll hook you up. Um, and, um, or just go find a JV deal, just go JV a deal. Um, but if you're doing deals, if you're doing three plus deals a month, it should be an absolute no brainer for you. hundred percent. Yeah. I say that people should be doing the early adoption part. I, I think we're still early in the game before, like a lot of people start, uh, using it and then it gets, you know, it gets to the point that, you know, Oh, I don't have the exclusive thing anymore. Uh, but right yeah. now you're exclusive. Trust me. This is going to be call up. I had before this was, was with. Steve Trang, literally the call before this. 
And the call I had last night was a demo for Sean Terry and all his students. So it's like by like, but by like mid next year, it's going to start people are, a lot of people are going to start figuring out what it is. So go grab that window and go monetize it and make some money. I mean, Absolutely. it's still going to make you a lot of money, but then it's going to be one of those things where if you don't have it, you're screwed because everyone else has it. So you got to have it. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's good. It's, it's pretty powerful, but watch the demo, watch the demo on the site. It's two hours. You watch it. I promise you it will blow your freaking mind. It'll be the best two hours. Uh, you'll spend in your investing business this year. I guarantee it. Like on I'll, my give you a tip. I'll give you a tip. Whenever I watch videos, I put on speed yeah. uh, times 1.5 or yeah. 2x. And I also download this Chrome extension called uh, Speed Controller if you want yeah. to. But you got to watch it. So, hey, guys, look, if you ever want to meet more of these creative and successful minds, in that are in our industry and that are doing big changes and doing big shifts for our industry to help you operate in another level, then you got to watch this again. You got to subscribe to this to this podcast. You got to download the episode and you got to share this with all your friends that know that they're going to get something out of this. Everything yeah. That's everything I'm asking. Share this, share this, share this with people, share this episode, whether you're listening in iTunes, Spotify, uh, whatever that is, uh, Google, Google podcast. Um, I'll appreciate you so much. And, yeah. um, you're I'll, also going to get, I'll going to say one more thing. Cause someone just popped in the question. What, what, what to watch, watch the first public demo. You can go to get G E T dot investorlift.com. Scroll down until it says, first public demo watch the video underneath that with dan schwartz that's a replay of the first public demo we did in march it will even if you have zero interest in buying an investor lift or don't even need it watch it because i also go through the, the whole roadmap i hold nothing back on how we've been taking company after company after company to a million a month sometimes even two million a month in assignment fees earned so i i give you all the tips and tricks in that video like just don't read the most successful people in the world. Do not reinvent the wheel. Look at the people that already do it. Take, take the playbooks from the people that are willing to share it and just apply them. Um, exactly. Don't change anything, apply them exactly. And you will be successful. Another thing that you asked me earlier, Spen, how people can reach out to me. Um, if you want to learn more about investor lift or you just want to connect or whatever, my Facebook, to be honest, gets bombarded by people trying to sell me VAs and like crypto people and like so like facebook is kind of a, a black hole my instagram i haven't really been that active on instagram so that's probably where like i get the less spam so that would probably be your best shot um and my instagram is just robert wensley r-o-b-e-r-t w-e-n-s-l-e-y and then if you don't hear back from me there and you just want to learn more there's live chat on the facebook website or you can email my team support at investorlift.com um, my wife and co-founder, she runs that team and they watch everything that comes in between 9 a.m. and 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time every day. And usually they'll get back to you within 10 minutes. So hopefully that's helpful. And hopefully I was able to drop some bombs here for uh some of the people watching this. And uh hopefully you guys can apply some of it to your businesses and and take your businesses to the next level. I think this is huge, man. My one of my goals here is to uh, really extract information from the true players that are in this industry and kind of create some sort of uh, coaching program that is for free. Uh, there's so many people that really need help and don't they don't have it organized. Uh, YouTube has a lot of content. Podcasts have a lot of content, but ultimately they don't really have it organized because there is no flow map. Yeah. Right now we're touching in this position. Well, this, this is another category after no, learning how to do lead gen and marketing and things like that. Well, this position is going to help you <laughs> move those properties. And especially if you're doing uh, a, a statewide or nationwide campaign. So uh, I, I really appreciate you being here, man. Uh, also helping me uh, and teaching me uh, about everything in video, podcasts, mics, things like that right before this. This was huge, man. As you can see, I've been trying to set up this property. Okay, but yeah. my, goal, my goal is to actually get as much value from these people and actionable tips so that they can go there and apply this right away to their business. 
And you've done just that. This is something that people can apply and can do and actually actually leverage uh, this uh, right away. Okay, so Robert, thank you so much, man. Love it. Uh, Thanks I for having see me on, that, man. I want to see. I want to see that that plane that you get. Uh, hopefully, I get to uh, Let's travel go for a ride. in there. <laughs> Let's go for Let's a ride. It. Let's make it happen, man. And uh, yeah, uh, for everyone interested in Investor Lift, you know where to go. Um, get that investorlift.com and use Esteban VIP uh, for a 10 percent discount. Thank you so much, everyone, and have a blast absolute day finish up your week week strong take care awesome thanks guys talk to you soon hope to connect to many of you very soon and get some of you guys in the vessel of family thanks guys all right